Hi, if you're into computers, you've probably heard of a couple file formats. Maybe zip if you're on Windows and targz if you're on Linux. And if you've done a bit of digging, you might have noticed that both of these happen to use the same compression algorithm. That compression algorithm is called deflate, and it's probably the most common lossless compression algorithm used in the world. So I guess let's start with the obvious question. What is a zip file and a tar file? If you're on Windows, you've probably used a zip file for one of two things. First of all, you can take large um, folders and you can compress them into a single item. This is obviously easier to stand over the internet, and at the other end, it can be extracted and you can get the full folder structure out of it. There's also a second reason you would zip an item, and that is for compression. If you have a lot of small text files, they take up more space than they need to, and you can losslessly compress all those text files. And that's what a zip file does. A tar file in Linux is something similar. When you tar a directory, it will take all the items in the directory and essentially append them to the end of each other. This has the benefit of making it very easy to back large directories up. A tar file on Linux will take a bunch of directories or fi and files in them, and it will basically just append them to the end of each other, so you end up with one continuous archive. TAR stands for tape archive, and that's presumably why it was done this way. If you have a large linear magnetic tape, you want to take all your files, append them to the end, and then you can write it in a linear fashion. This does what the first part of zip does. It takes large amounts of files or directories or entire systems, and it will basically turn it into a linear uh, format. This makes it, again, easy to backup or send. Now, TAR files by on their own are actually not compressed. This actually lends to one of the benefits of the Unix philosophy where we can take the same tar file and we can compress it in a bunch of different ways. The most common and one of the oldest compression methods in use is gzip. gzip uses the deflate algorithm just like zip files do. It's one of the most widely used lossless compression algorithms. It's fast and it has a decent compression ratio, especially when you're giving it text files. Obviously, it has been superseded in algorithms that are both faster or better compressing these days, that you would, and you would probably pick one of those instead. Nonetheless, gzip remains installed on almost every Unix-based computer or Linux computer. That, this makes it very useful because it's very widely compatible, and you can be assured that if you send your fellow Linux friend a gzip file, they'll probably be able to open it. In fact, modern browsers also support gzipping entire web pages. If you have a large web page, you can just losslessly compress it and send it. This makes sense when your CPU is faster than your internet link, because this way you can use less internet bandwidth to transfer larger amount of data. It just takes a CPU trade-off to both compress and decompress that on each end. So at this point then it's probably sounding like both of these are similar. Oh, and there's a couple other things to tar. The reason you would use a tar file in Linux instead of a zip file mainly comes down to the fact that tar files preserve all the file attributes properly, where zip files don't. This is mainly because uh, Unix-based systems have more file attributes than Windows file systems do. So on a Unix system, you would want to save creation date, last access date, last notified date. You also have your user permissions, group permissions, and permissions for everyone else. So all of these need to be saved as part of the archive so that when you, when you expand it, you get all of it back. This might not matter so much if you're just sending a file to a friend, but this matters a lot when you're backing into our systems. If I back up a server, I won't be able to restore from that backup while maintaining all the file permissions. It wouldn't make much sense if I restored from a backup and everything in my system was accessible to everyone. That would kind of ruin the whole point of having it in the first place. So tar files being developed for that purpose uh, store more metadata than Windows. So then both of these are similar formats, but so how do they differ beyond just one storing more file system attributes? Well, one difference is that when you're doing a tar.gz, you're first compressing everything into a tar file, and then you're compressing the result of it. This means that step one is to append all the files and directories to each other so that it becomes a linear format. And then you take this linear format, and often you just stream it or you pipe it into a compression algorithm such as gzip. By the way, this fact that this is done in two steps, first, first turned into archive and then compressing it, is what also makes it very easy to substitute compression algorithms. Take out gzip and you can add bzip to, or on a modern computer you can add xz, or lz, or z standard, or lz4. Point being, there's a lot of different compression algorithms you can use, and it's essentially interchangeable. The first step is separate from the second. But where zip and tar.gz files truly differ is the order in which those two steps are done. A zip file is much more like a gz.tar file than it is a tar.gz. What does this mean? Well, on a zip file, you first compress each file individually, and then you append the compressed versions. 
Whereas on a tar.gz file, you first appended everything and then you compress the result. They're two different approaches and they both have their benefits and drawbacks. Let's talk about why you might want to compress everything first individually and then append them. Well, first of all, it means that if I want to extract a particular file, I don't need to decompress the entire archive. If I have files uh, numbered 1 through 100 and I want to access the 50th file, you just take where the 50th file is, you decompress it, and you can view it. This makes it a lot faster when you want to decompress individual files so that you can view them. This is useful because if I sent you 100 pictures and you wanted to view the 50th picture, you just, you just take the 50th picture and you can decompress it. You don't need to decompress everything leading up to that point. And part of this is because zip files store the actual uh, system information and metadata um, at the start, which means that you know you know precisely where each file is going to start and how long each file is. So to read the 50th file, I can just look that up in the table. Hey, it starts here and it's this long and I just read for that length. And then you can you decompress that and you view it. Now, another advantage, at least on modern computers, is if you're compressing each file individually, that's very highly parallelizable. If I have a thousand files and I have eight CPU cores, we can compress eight files at a time without really impacting the compression uh, ratio. Whereas if I had a large thing to compress and uh, you, can still, you can still parallelize it, but due to the nature of how you're dividing it into chunks, you're going to, you're going to lose some of the you're going to lose some of the compression ratio and you're going to get slightly worse compression. Is it a big deal? On modern systems, no, but it is still something to consider. Now, let's talk about some of the drawbacks of compressing each file individually. The most obvious one is that you lose out on compression ratio. If I have two text files that are identical and back to back, if I'm compressing them individually, I'm going to compress both the files and just end up appending them to each other when that redundancy could have been removed. This is an advantage when it comes to, to appending first and compressing the linear data later. Um, in that case, if I, since all the text files would have been appended first, when gzip was running through it and it saw these redundancies, the redundancies would have been removed. I'm not implying that compression is a deduplicator. It in no way takes the place of deduplication among the chain. You should still deduplicate your files to save on space. Um, but I'm saying that if two files are very similar within the same window size, that redundancy will be removed. Now, as I just said, this only works if the two files are within the same window size. If I'm only compressing and looking up stuff that was in the past megabyte and an identical file happened four megabytes ago, obviously the compressor will have no idea of it in this case. It would have already gone out of the compression pipeline and you wouldn't get the benefit in that case. This is where modern systems with a lot of RAM come in because you can have much larger windows these days because, you know, we can store and index that properly. So in short, the main advantage is that you would save on these redundancies. Second advantage is that it's a uniform system. Um, you can just decompress it and you get the full archive back in its original form. This makes it easy, for example, if you're going to back up the tape or something, right? You can compress the entire archive, back it up, and then you would just uncompress it, or you would first decompress it, and then you have your original backup file, which might be useful. Now, the obvious disadvantage of this approach is that if I want to get the 50th file again, I need to decompress everything leading up to that point. This makes tar files slower to work with usually. Different compression algorithms obviously bear differently with this. Something like bzip2 is slower than gzip. XZ is actually often faster, or something that has very high compression ratio is probably going to be a lot slower. So this means that if I have this one contiguous compressed archive and I want to get to this particular point, I first have to decompress everything. And once again, depending on the algorithm, that can be a painfully slow process. So that's one thing that this approach is lacking. Now, part of the reason this is also bad is because tar files, I believe, store the metadata near the end. Due to this nature of the fact that compression happens after everything is appended, tar files cannot keep an index of where each file is going to begin at the start. Because depending on your compression, that's not really known. Whereas on something like 7-zip, 7-zip uses continuous um, compression just like tar files do, but they still save the index at the start, which is why you can view the directory listing in a zip file. There's actually ways of getting that zip-like effect in tar files. Unusual convention, I guess, that some people use, gz.tar files. That is when you gzip each file individually, and then you make a tar file out of the result of this. Now, this behaves like zip, and it has advantages and disadvantages that you would think. 
Um, unfortunately, most archivers cannot deal with these files. So if you extract this and you want to get the 50th item, you'll probably have to enter the command to decompress it manually. I don't know of very many archive managers that can just decompress the file like that. They'll open the tar file, no problem, but then you'll just have a bunch of files with GZ, like gzip appended to the end. And so to view any of them, you would have to, you know, decompress the file individually anyway. It is something to consider. It is faster and it can be parallelized, but it has not really any of the benefits that a zip file does while having the drawbacks of compressing each file individually. So I don't really recommend it. Instead, another approach is to use indexed tar files. This happens at the form of several compression algorithms. For example, PIGZ, which stands for Parallel Indexed GZIP. There's also PIGZ, which is Parallel Indexed XZIP. Now, these have a couple advantages. A, uh, often there are multi-threaded implementations. So normally your regular tar.gz could only be compressed or decompressed on a single CPU core, which is the main drawback of compressing as a contiguous archive. So, of course, these days, as I just mentioned, there are multi-threaded versions. So, for example, PIGZ will split your data up, compress it uh, on multiple CPU cores. You lose a bit of ratio, but it's still way better than compressing each file individually. And the second benefit is it'll actually index where each of the files are. So you don't need to open and read the entire tar file to get at that one file. Similarly, PIGZ will is a parallel implementation of um, XZ. Now, XZ on its own already happens to be pretty good at being multi-threaded. I believe all those changes have since been merged, but it also indexes the tar files. And this means that, and these files are completely compatible with regular uh, tar usually. So if you just have a regular gzip um, installed, you will still be able to decompress it, uh, but you'll have to decompress the full archive. Whereas if you have the index version installed, it'll be able to look at that index and basically just fast forward to where it needs to go and read from there so that you can get the file you want. This is actually a similar approach to what 7-zip does. The way 7-zip works is it'll actually use solid blocks, just like tar does, where it'll store files in large chunks um, and then compress the whole chunk. Once again, this has the benefit that it essentially will get rid of redundancies between multiple files. If I have source code files that are all similar, but slightly different, you can get rid of that redundancy, or at least a good compression algorithm would. But while it's doing this, 7-zip will also store the index of all the files up front. This is why you can open up a 7-zip file and it'll get the directory and file listing instantly. You don't have to wait at all for it to figure out where each file is because that's already stored. Whereas on a tar file, if I want to get the listing of all the files and directories in here, you need to wait for it to read the whole archive. As I just said, exception to this is if you're using a uh, indexed uh, tar such as PIGZ or PIGZ. That's kind of the rough overview. With 7-zip, you could disable that feature, but then your compression ratio would be just like zip. And 7-zip, for those of you curious, just uses LZMI2 by default. And uh, surprise, LZMI2 is the same compression algorithm that that XZ happens to use. So if you have a tar.xz file, it's essentially the same algorithm that 7z files are using. And this is why you will get very similar compression ratios out of the two, because they're both turning files into solid box and compressing that. Um, I guess the difference is that 7-zip will open slightly faster and usually can get a slightly better ratio because it doesn't have to support all the other attributes that, you know, Linux and other Unix-based systems do. So what should you use? If you're on Linux, you can probably keep using tar.xz, or in this case, uh, I would recommend looking at tar.zstd first, uh, because it happens to be a lot faster than xz, while maintaining pretty much the same compression ratio. The compression is a bit faster, but the main advantage is that decompression is almost five to six times faster than regular xz files. So I'd strongly recommend you take a look at that. If you're going to make backups on a Linux system, you don't want to use 7-zip or anything. That will get rid of all your file attributes, which will be a separate headache on its own. So you should stick to tar. If you're still, if you're intent on using XZ though, do take a look at uh, PIXZ, which is parallel indexed XZ. It might help make it easier when you need to decompress it so that you can view one file and you'll be able to get those listings pretty much instantaneously if you have it installed. For those of you that want an easier approach, I guess you can use 7-zip um, because PIXZ and um, PIXZ don't have very good GUIs if they do at all on Nix systems. Um, so you can still use 7-Z, it's, you know, it's cross compatible with Windows and Mac and Linux, so that happens to make it a that happens to be a great favor in support of it. And it also happens to get a lot better compression ratio than regular zip files do. So that's another great benefit of it. Um, I think the benefits of just using zip or like gz.tar files is gone because you know modern compression algorithms like Z standard and XZ tend to scale well to multiple processors on their own anyway. So you don't need to compress each file individually and then you know append the result of that. 
the parallelization advantage is kind of gone. The decompressing files individually advantage is shrinking, especially now that we we have indexed tar files and, you know, and 7-zip, which is also equally indexed. Thank you so much for watching this rather long video on compression systems and the advantage and, and drawbacks of compressing each file individually and appending it versus making a linear file format first and then compressing the result of that as a solid archive. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you found this interesting. Um, hopefully it sheds some light into why things are the way they are, why you might have experienced some slowdowns on tar.gz, for example, versus why zip might open instantaneously. Um, and also, I guess you just maybe learned some trivia facts about what deflate is or what LZMA2 is. For more reading on those, obviously check out the Wikipedia articles. Um, I will have them linked down below so that you guys can go learn more. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you learned something, consider leaving a like. Uh, I guess you can subscribe to the channel as well if you want to see more future videos like this. Uh, so thanks for watching. Hope you, hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Bye.